Welcome to Project Management. In this video, I will talk about project scheduling. In a previous video, we talked about how to build a project network and calculate the project duration using the critical path method. The implicit assumption was that resources would be available in the required amounts were needed. However, this is not always true. Some resources are shared with other projects and may be still occupied due to various uncertainties. Two key concepts of this video is that project network times are not a schedule until resources have been assigned, and cost estimates are not a budget until they have been time phased. There are different types of project constraints that can affect the project schedule. The first type is called technical or logic constraints. We have integrated such constraints when we build a project network. They are related to the networked sequence in which project activities must occur. For example, when writing a software program, three activities should be carried out in sequence, designing the program, coding, and testing. Another example, when building a house, three activities should happen in sequence establishing the foundation, building the frame, and mounting the roof. The duration of a project may be delayed if resources are not adequate. Resource constraints can mean absence, deficiency, or shortage of people, materials, and equipment for completing project activities. For example, assume you are planning a wedding reception that includes three activities, making a plan, hiring a band, sending out invitations, and decorating the hall. Each activity takes one day. The three activities could be done in parallel by different people because there is no technical reason or dependency why they must happen in sequence. However, if there is only one person available to perform all three activities, the resource constraint requires the activities be performed in sequence. Clearly, the consequence is a delay and a very different set of network relationships will be created. Physical constraints can also affect the project schedule because activities may not occur in parallel or are affected by contractual or environmental conditions. Working in a mine is an example of physical constraints. Since space allows only a few people to work at the same time, all tasks have to be performed sequentially. Most of the scheduling methods available today require the project manager to classify the project as either time constraint or resource constraint. A time constraint project must be completed by an imposed date. Although the time is fixed, the resources can be flexible. Additional resources can be requested to ensure the project meets the schedule. On the other hand, a resource constraint project has a fixed level of available resources and it cannot be exceeded. However, the time could be flexible because inadequate resources will delay the project. The project manager needs to review the priority matrix we introduced in a previous video to determine which case fits their project. In this example, the scope is constrained. It means the scope of the project is fixed and cannot be changed. Time is enhanced, which means the project manager should take advantage of every opportunity to shorten the project schedule. Cost is accepted, which means when trade-offs have to be made, it's acceptable to go over budget to make sure the quality of the project doesn't sacrifice. There are likely to be natural limits to the extent managers can constrain, enhance, or accept any one criterion. For example, it may be desirable to finish a project one month early, but after that, further shortening the project duration may be prohibitively expensive. I'll use an example to explain how to allocate resources for time-constrained projects. This botanic garden project uses only one type of resource, called backhoes. 
A backhoe is a combination of an excavator and a bulldozer. The project involves six activities. It starts with garden design, which takes one week, and it doesn't need any heavy equipment yet. After the design is complete, the work on walkways, irrigation, and fence can all start. They will need two backhoes, one backhoe, and one backhoe, respectively. They will be finished within three weeks. After walkways are done, we may start to work on lighting, which will need one backhoe and last for three weeks. After lighting, irrigation and fence are all done. The final activity, planting, can start. It needs three backhoes and lasts for two weeks. Overall, the project duration is nine weeks. This figure is a project gun chart. The dependencies are shown with the vertical connecting arrows. The horizontal arrows represent activity slack. This figure shows the total resource demand for each week. We can see that the resource demand goes through some ups and downs. This could be costly from an economic point of view. Because backhoes are expensive equipment, we want to utilize them as much as possible. However, between week 4 and week 6, some backhoes will be idled, and this is a huge waste of resources. Probably they cannot be used by other projects because transportation back and forth of this piece of huge and heavy equipment costs money. Let's assume this is a time-constrained project. It must be completed by week 9. We will use leveling techniques and move non-critical activities to smooth the resource demand without delaying the whole project. In order to level the demand, we can utilize the slack and delay irrigation and fence for three weeks. So now the number of backhoes needed from week one to week three is reduced from four to two. And the number of backhoes needed from week 4 to week 7 is increased from 1 to 3. The new demand profile is much smoother and involves much less fluctuation in resource demand than the original one. The project will still be finished within 9 weeks. The backhoes needed over the life of the project have been reduced from 4 to 3. This is achieved at the cost of loss of flexibility because the slack is reduced, and it increases the criticality of some activities. Note that pushing leveling too far is risky. It is possible that many non-critical activities then become critical. In this example, all activities are critical now. For resource-constrained projects, Resources are limited in quantity or availability. And the scheduling problem is a complex combinatorial problem. Activities are usually scheduled using heuristics or rules of thumb to minimize the delay without exceeding the resource limit or changing the technical network relationships. It's an iterative process starting at the first time period of the project and scheduling period by period all the activities using the three priority rules. Rule 1, least slack, rule 2, smallest duration, and rule 3, lowest activity identification number. If three activities are eligible to start and require the same resource, the first activity placed in the schedule would be the activity with the least slack, which is rule 1. If all activities have the same slack, the next rule would be the activity with the smallest duration which is rule 2. When all eligible activities have the same slack and the same duration, the tie is broken by the lowest activity identification number, which is rule 3. We also assume that an activity cannot be split when we schedule the project. Once an activity is started, it is carried to completion. Note that heuristics do not always yield an optimal schedule but they are very capable of yielding a good schedule for very complex networks that cannot be solved by any other methods. 
Let's see an example. This is a software development project network with six activities, from A to F. Each activity is represented by a 9-cell block. The legend of these blocks is shown at the bottom right corner. For activity A, its early start time is 0, early finish time is 1, late start time is 0, and late finish time is 1. It has no total slack or free slack, and it needs two programmers, which are the resource, to finish the job in a duration of one week. Other blocks can be read in a similar way. There are four critical activities. They are marked in pink. The critical path of the project is A, C, E, F. Assuming there are enough programmers, that means no resource constraints. Then the project can be done within nine weeks. Here I show the same project information but in form of a table. The activity IDs, the resources, a number of programmers needed for each activity, the durations, early start, late finish, and total slacks are listed on the first six columns. Activity A lasts for one week. We use one cell to demonstrate this. The label 2P means this activity needs two programmers. Activity B has a duration of four weeks and a slack of two weeks. So we use six cells to demonstrate this. The first four cells require two programmers, and the last two cells are just slacks. The other rows can be explained in a similar manner. The thumbnail on the top right corner shows the project network, which shows the relationships among the activities. The bottom row shows the total number of programmers needed for each week, starting with two programmers, then goes up to 4 and 5, then down to 3, 2, and at last 1. The question is, what if there are only 3 programmers available for this project? In that case, we definitely need to reschedule some activities to compensate for the lack of resources, and the project could be delayed. Let's use the heuristics to find the resource constraint project schedule. Seems we are good for the first week, because we have three programmers, which is more than needed, two programmers. For the time between one and two, we start to have resource shortage. We need four programmers, but we only have three. We need to decide which of these two activities, B or C, should be scheduled first. Apply rule 1, we find activity C has least slack, so it should start next. Then we consider activity B. It requires two programmers, but only one is remaining because we already assigned the other two to activity C. Therefore, we need to delay activity B by three weeks so that it doesn't have any overlapping with activity C. Update its early start from 1 to 4, the late finish time from 7 to 8, and the total slack is reduced from 2 to minus 1. In order to keep project network relationships as shown on the top right corner, we also need to delay activity F by one week, because activity F cannot start until activity B is finished. We need to update activity F's early start, late finish, and total slack numbers as well. After that, we recalculate the total number of programmers for each week and update the bottom row in this table. For the time between 4 and 5, we start to have resource shortage again. We need 5 programmers, but we only have 3. We need to decide which of the 3 activities B, D, or E should be scheduled first. Apply rule 1 again, we find activity B has least slack now, so it should start next. Then we consider activity E. It requires two programmers, but only one is remaining, so we cannot schedule it now. The next eligible activity is activity D. Since it only requires one programmer, we load activity D into the schedule. 
Therefore, we need to delay activity E by four weeks so that it doesn't have any overlapping with activity B. Update activity E's early start, late finish, and total slack. In order to keep project network relationships as shown on the top right corner, we also need to delay activity F by three weeks because activity F cannot start until activity E is finished. Then we update activity F's early start, late finish, and total slack numbers. Due to the delay of activity E, activity D will enjoy more slack. We need to update its late finish and total slack as well. After that, we recalculate the total number of programmers for each week and update the bottom row in this table. Repeat this process and check the rest of the project schedule. For the time between 8 and 9, we don't have resource shortage. So we load activity E into the schedule. Finally, for the time between 11 and 12, we don't have resource shortage. So we load activity F into the schedule. And this is the final resource constraint project schedule, and all activities are loaded. The total number of programmers is always less than or equal to 3 at the bottom row. The project end time is pushed from week 9 to week 13. For this example, we only use the least slack to schedule parallel activities when there is a shortage, and didn't use the other two rules, smallest duration and smallest ID. But you may run into cases you need to use these rules in real-world applications. This is a new project network, with updated start times, finish times, and slacks. The critical activities are marked in pink. The number of critical activities has increased from 4 to 5. Manually scheduling the resource scheduling problem using the heuristic method is easy for small projects. However, it will quickly get overwhelming and tedious for projects involving more than a dozen of activities. Fortunately, many project management software like Microsoft Project is capable of assessing and resolving complicated resource constraint schedules using heuristics similar to what was described above. Users only need to provide relevant information, and the software will automatically find out the optimal schedule. Tutorials about how to use Microsoft Project resource leveling is available in another video playlist. Failure to consider resource limitations can lead to serious problems for our project manager. If used effectively, software can be very helpful when investigating what-if scenarios. Let's consider a hypothetical example here. An organization is developing a two-year plan for a project using Microsoft Project. Management is pleased to note that the project appeared to be doable in the two-year time frame until someone noticed that the resource column in Microsoft Project is blank. Management requests to try the project with resources included. Then the two-year project turns into a 3.5-year project because of the shortage of specific labor skills. However, after playing with the Microsoft Project model for a while, the project manager realizes that Adding only three skilled people would allow the project to be finished within the two-year plan. Further analysis shows hiring only two more people beyond the three would allow an extra year of work to be also compressed into the two-year plan. This example demonstrates the effectiveness of what-if analysis. So far, we have been assuming that an activity cannot be split when we schedule the project. Once the activity is started, it is carried to completion. We do this for the sake of simplicity. In real-world projects, some activities can be split into multiple sections. For example, building a 3-mile road can be split into three 1-mile sections. 
Splitting is a scheduling technique for creating a better project schedule and increase resource utilization. As shown in this figure, it involves interrupting work on an activity to employ the resource on another activity, then returning the resource to finish the interrupted work. Splitting is only feasible when startup and shutdown costs are low for an activity. It should not be overused. Otherwise, it can be a major reason why projects fail to meet schedule. The most common error is to interrupt people work when there are high conceptual startup and shutdown costs. Planners should avoid the use of splitting as much as possible, except in situations where splitting costs are known to be small, when there is no alternative for resolving the resource problem. Computer software like Microsoft Project offers a splitting option for each activity. My advice is, only use it sparingly. When assigning project tasks to team members, project managers have a natural tendency to assign the most difficult tasks to the best people in the team. They are trying to match the demand and requirements of specific work with the qualifications and experience of available participants. However, there are good reasons why project managers should not overdo this. Otherwise, the best team members may resent that they are always given the toughest assignments, and the less experienced participants resent that they are never given the opportunity to expand their skill or knowledge base. There could be other factors to be considered in deciding who should work together. For example, veterans should be teamed up with new hires, not only so they can share their experience but also to help socialize the newcomers to the customs and norms of the organization. People who are good at technical work can work together with those who are good at documentation because they complement each other. To minimize unnecessary tension, managers should pick people with compatible work habits and personalities. Speaking of office tension or stress, watch this commercial video. This is a good example that some people cannot work together. We have discussed the key resource allocation issues within the context of a single project. In reality, resource allocation generally occurs in a multi-project environment where the demands of one project have to be reconciled with the needs of other ongoing projects. Multi-project scheduling is more difficult than single-project scheduling due to the problem size and complexity. Multiple threads of tasks are tangled and more effort will be needed. One common problem with multi-project scheduling is overall project slippage. Delay on one project creates delays for other projects. Another problem is inefficient resource utilization. The peaks and valleys of resource demands create scheduling problems and delays for projects. The effects of resource bottlenecks will be enlarged because shortages of critical resources required by multiple projects cause delays and schedule extensions. There are some best practices in project management field to deal with problems associated with multi-project scheduling. It's recommended to create a project management office to oversee the scheduling of resources across all the projects in the organization. The project office can use the project priority queuing system to schedule resources when there is a conflict. It could be a first-come, first-served system. It could also be a color-coded system with red projects having the highest priority and yellow projects the second highest priority, etc. The project office is a central place for project management, and it treats all projects as a part of a mega project. As a last resort, an organization can outsource some projects to reduce the number of projects handled internally to make the multi-project scheduling a little bit less difficult. Once the resource schedule has been finalized, we are able to develop a budget baseline for the project to time-phase the work packages. 
the time phased budget baseline will be used to determine if the project is on, ahead, or behind schedule, and on, over, or under budget. It will also be used to determine how much work has been accomplished for the allocated money spent. The importance of a time phased budget baseline can be demonstrated by the following example. The development of a new project is to be completed in 10 weeks at an estimated budget of $0.2 million per week. Therefore, the total budget of the project is $2 million. We know that the planned budget for the first five weeks is $1 million. However, at the end of the fifth week, which is the middle point of the project, we observed that the actual spending is $1.4 million. So what can we conclude from here? It turns out we cannot draw a conclusion about whether the project is on, ahead of, or behind schedule. Neither can we say anything about whether the project is on, over, or under budget. The thing is, we don't know how much work is supposed to be accomplished for the planned budget and how much work has already been accomplished for the money spent. Let's see how to create a time phased budget baseline using the project schedule we created earlier in this video. We assume the only cost involved in this project is related to programmer's time. The number of programmers needed each week is listed at the bottom row. This project lasts for 13 weeks. The weekly salary of a programmer is $2,000. Based on the weekly salary, let's convert the number of programmers into cost. For example, activity A needs two programmers in the first week. So the budget is $4,000. We do this calculation for all activities and all sales. And we add another row at the bottom to show the cumulative budget over the life of the project. This figure shows the cumulative time-phased budget in a diagram throughout the life of the project. The time-phased project budget baseline is also called the planned value. It will be used later to be compared with the actual value and the earned value, which will be introduced in another video. To summarize, in this video, we talked about time-constraint and resource-constraint project scheduling. I also showed you how to create a time-phased project budget baseline. That's all. This is Yong Wang. I'll see you in the next video.